All right, hello everyone. So we're here to talk about DevSecOps, mainly DevSecOps in Postgres. All right, so I'm here representing the Global Center of Excellence from Fujitsu. My name is Tim Stewart. I'm a principal data enterprise architect with Fujitsu. So DevSecOps. So when I thought about DevSecOps and tried to understand exactly what DevSecOps was, I looked for a definition. So here's a quote that I came up with, or I found actually. So DevSecOps is the use of traditional development, security and operations functions to increase the security of applications and digital services. So if we think about this quote here, it's actually saying that you have your traditional development, the development that most people are used to, and then you're combining security. But what you're actually trying to do is increase the actual process. So we'll focus on increase as we go further. So as an agenda, we're going to talk about an introduction to DevSecOps. We're going to touch on Jenkins and why it's important. And then we're going to get into some PostgreSQL database security. We're not going to touch on all the database security within Postgres, but we're going to touch on some key things that can help you with your pipelines. And then we're also going to touch on some compliance and controls, and then some automation and management as well. So an introduction to DevSecOps. So when we think about learning anything new, right, it's all about learning your wealth of knowledge and trying to figure out how can I learn this? Because new topics can be overwhelming. But if you think about it, there was a time when they said you can put a pillow, take your pillow, excuse me, and put a book under your pillow and you could absorb this knowledge. I'm not sure if that actually works, right? You can listen to a YouTube video while you're sleeping and try and absorb that knowledge as well, right? But anytime you try and learn something new, it's like a knowledge overflow, right? So education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Often when you learn something new, it's like drinking from the fire hose. So thinking about DevSecOps and introducing that into your CCID, what we have is common things that you're used to today. There are two typical challenges that industries are facing. The first challenge is what's going on with DevSecOps, right? We have this traditional development and now we have to try and figure out how can we take this traditional development and move it into DevOps even, right? Before we even get to the SecOps, right? We're moving it to DevOps. And then there's also vulnerabilities that we're trying to plug. So companies are trying to plug these vulnerabilities and take these two together and figure out what's next, what's our next step. The whole time what you're trying to do is identify code defects. Identifying code defects and try and figure out when can we identify these code defects. Can we do it in the beginning? Can we do it in the middle? Do we have to do it at the end? You're trying to increase the amount of time it takes to find these code defects. You want to find them faster, not later, right? So if you think about it, if you want to fail, you want to fail fast. So you want to find the defects as fast as you can. Now we think about compliance, right? We all have compliance, so we're trying to find defects so we can still meet our compliance and understand that if we're trying to meet our compliance, we can't compromise on anything. From a security standpoint, we can't make any compromises on our software delivery. So when we combine the security, not making any compromises, that's what you get with your DevSecOps. That's when security comes into play. Because what you're actually talking about is a continuous flow of security, right? So when doing your entire software development life cycle, you want to add security into the process. Security not at the beginning of the process, not at the end and not at the middle, but it has to be a continuous flow of security that you're trying to add throughout the process. And while you're doing that, there's several things that you have to do. There's monitoring and security checks that you have to put in place as well to increase your pipeline and increase that security within your pipeline. Now, there are a lot of tools in the industry. There are a lot of tools that you can use. The application development team has several tools that they use, and so does the DBA team. But when you think about this DevSecOps process, Everyone needs to know what the other team is doing because now it's the responsibility 
of everyone. Security is everyone's responsibility. So as an application developer, you need to know a little bit about what the DBA tools are, and the DBA needs to know a little bit about what the developer tools are. Why? Because these tools have some key features that will affect the other teams. So it's important to learn a little bit about what those tools are. When you take these tools, if you're an application developer, from that standpoint, you're always taking your tools, you're applying your tools, you're moving your source code into a version control system. A lot of times people forget about the database, the database itself. The database has to be versioned as well. So your database schema should also be moved into your source code system and have some versioning as well. Right? So if your application is on version 11.2.1, you should have a schema associated with 11.2.1 as well that you've moved into your pipeline as well. So that's something you want to fully integrate into your pipeline. Now Jenkins. Jenkins is probably the most popular tool within the Postgres industry right now. Why is it so popular? It's popular, I believe, because of its flexibility. Just like the Postgres database is pretty flexible, Jenkins is also a pretty flexible tool that you can use. So the flexibility that it offers, it also offers some innovation. So if we think about this quote here, put innovation at the heart of your thinking process. So if you look, the author of this quote is the CEO of Agilium. We think Agilium, we think Agile. So he's thinking, Innovation, putting innovation at the start of your process. So when it comes to using Jenkins, Jenkins needs to be a part of the process, but not only in the beginning and not in the end, but it has to be the heart, the focal point of your process, right? The hub of your whole system. So if you think about your human body, you have your heart. Your heart is not necessarily in the center. It's off-centered, but everything flows throughout your heart. Right, all your blood is going to pump and flow throughout your heart. So everything within your pipeline has to flow through Jenkins. If it's not Jenkins, any tool that you're using, everything should flow. Right? So it has to be the center of everything that you're doing. So it has to be a critical part of what you're doing, and that's the innovation that it provides. Now, part of that innovation will allow you to do things that you don't necessarily have to use it for everything that it offers. You may just want to use it for the CI portion of Jenkins, right? You may want to do some manual deployments through Jenkins. You have that capability as well, right? Because you take the framework and apply it to what you need. Because that framework has to be a part of everything that you do. So you adopt the entire framework within your infrastructure. Now, if we think about some of the flexibility for it as well, there are several plugins, as you can see, that it actually uses, right? Within the last six to nine months, I would say one of the most popular ones that I've heard was HashiCorp Vault, right? HashiCorp Vault, very popular. Some of the other ones, such as Terraform, Bitbucket, they've already been there and they've been in use a lot, right? So people have already adopted them. So just showing the many plugins that you can use shows the flexibility, the innovation that Jenkins can offer. And if you take a look at the graphic, and if we look at this, we'll say, if this is your cycle, you have to make sure that that innovation is at every stage, every stage of your cycle, right? So you have to have innovation, not just at the build phase or the test phase, but innovation has to be a true part of everything that you have within your pipeline. So touching on some of the benefits of Jenkins, right? you have the flexibility to issue your code and push your code. Your code can be pushed via shell scripts. You can have bat files as well when you're trying to push your code in. Right? You can do some filtering of things to help with some of the little minor work so that you don't have all of the minor work with Jenkins. And utilizing the scheduler that comes with Jenkins as well. Right? So Jenkins has a pretty nice scheduler, and then that's going to help you with your scheduling of your test. When it comes to testing, there's functional tests, there's performance tests. There's also load testing is very critical. One of the key tools that's used for load testing is Apache JMeter. 
Apache JMeter is pretty popular now as well. So from a load testing perspective, that's something that can be implemented and also utilized within your pipeline as well. Now from integrating into Jenkins, Jenkins jobs or if it's Ansible jobs, you have that ability to do that type of integration. Jenkins is gonna give you a pretty nice console to use. So you can utilize the console of Jenkins. It's gonna help you with adding new hosts, managing nodes, adding new nodes as well. You're gonna have that flexibility all from within the console of Jenkins. Right? Now, Jenkins is gonna be able to help you from a deployment standpoint, right? Whether it's your single or multi-tier deployments as well. And then you can also add some psql commands as well. So if you have some psql scripts, you can have those commands and use Jenkins to help you with that as well. Now I have a little example here in the middle. This is an example of how you can actually create that deployment script using a release number. The release number is going to be key for identifying what you're trying to deploy. PostgreSQL database security. Now here's a quote. Security is the essential roadblock to achieving the roadmap to peace. So peace is very important, especially when you think about the security standpoint. You need peace, peace with each other, peace of mind. It's gonna be critical. So if we think about this, how can you achieve that peace? Peace with other teams, other teams within your environment. So the DBA needs to have peace with the applications team. The applications team needs to have peace with the operations team. So what you need is a baseline, a security baseline. So you need to create a security baseline. Now, every CISO from your security group may have their own idea of their security baseline. Their security baseline, their security policies are the policies for the entire company. But within your own groups, you need to have your own baseline, your own baseline standards. Your baseline standards may incorporate some of the items from your company's security policy. And if you're on the application side, they may incorporate some items from the database team's policy as well. But you need to create your own baseline standards. Baseline standards with the security items that you need for your application. Now, when it comes to where do you get guidance from the industry on how to create this baseline or information to put into your baseline, here are some key things that I listed to help you get that guidance. There is the Center for Internet Security. There are some CIS benchmarks. And the one thing I skipped here that I wanna talk about is the STIG, Security Technical Implementation Guide. So a lot of times when you try to bring in a new vendor into your companies, one of the key requests is to see if that vendor has a Security Technical Implementation Guide. That's very critical. But one of the things that they may not have is an app dev STIG an application development STIG. A lot of people overlook that STIG. That's gonna be critical as well, because typically if you're thinking just about the database and how to implement the database, what about the application? The app dev STIG is something that directly affects the application. It may have some key database things in it as well, but the app dev STIG is gonna be important to your environment as well. Now, when it comes to reviewing your new baseline standards, you need to compile everything from all teams, and all teams need to collectively understand and review these standards, because remember, security is not just the responsibility of one person anymore. It's the responsibility of all teams, the security team, the database, and the development team. So all teams should be included when it comes to reviewing these standards. And then what goes on your baseline standard? Your baseline standard, if you create a template for it, it should include things such as the security item number and a description. Description should contain not only what the name of an item is, but where and what area does it affect the application, right? If it affects the application login, then you need to have that type of information in the description. And then there's also an item status and the frequency of when it's checked, right? So the check frequency is gonna be key 
because if you're releasing every 90 days, but if your check frequency is 100 days, then you're going to have a problem. You might miss some things. So you need to make sure that those things are actually in sync. So automation, automation of Postgres security. So Postgres security, you take your baseline standards, and then you want to automate them. The reason is you want to have these things automated is we can, well, we can actually just focus on the flow chart here, right? So everything within the flow chart is typically a pretty smooth process. But at any point in this flow chart, if you have a breakdown, you're pretty much starting from the start all over again, right? So you want to have a process that's automated, relieve any manual intervention, and then your process can be pretty smooth as you go through your security. Applying your standards, your baseline standards, which are going to follow all the way through your flow chart. That's going to help with the consistency, building consistency, helping you meet any compliance regulations as well. So all of your security hardening that you have to do is going to be included into your baseline standards, whether it's password lengths, the amount of time your password has to be changed, application field lengths, all of that type of security hardening are things that you can include within your standards. Now security patching. Security patching is done at multiple levels. Typically, if you're on the application side, you typically will think about just your application and the frequency when you have to apply your application and what affects the application. But if you're on the OS layer or the database layer, you also have packets, packages, patches, excuse me, and then they have a certain frequency as well. So understanding the frequency of the patches, understanding the detail of the patches from either group. So the applications team needs to understand what type of patches the database team are doing, what type of patches the OS layer is doing. If the OS layer is packaging a package or binary or affecting some library, then that could possibly affect your application. So you need to understand what those patches are doing too and then understand that frequency. You know, a lot of times people will apply patches based off the frequency and urgency of what their needs are, not necessarily the complexity and how it will affect your application. So understanding those key areas of complexity, urgency, frequency, and also the detail of those patches will be critical. And then understanding if those patches are applied using a program or if they're going to do some manual level patching as well. Those things are going to be critical. So there are various things that are needed from a security standpoint. Encryption is one of those things. There's various levels of encryption. So some of the types of encryption would be your data at rest encryption, some examples like your PG crypt, using PG crypto, your full disk encryption, transparent data encryption, and then your data in transit encryption as well. And we'll touch on some of these things. There's also data masking. So data masking is critical to your environments as well. So you want to make sure that you have the capability to add some masking in place as well. So if you don't have a masking tool or a masking utility, those are things that you can actually do manually through a program as well. You can use some kind of random number generator, transforming the code as well, manipulating the field data so that the data is truly masked within your environments. But this will help you with your standards, especially your PCI standards, and help you protecting data that's online and offline as well. And then understanding what type of masking data is needed or why you're actually masking the data, whether it's the PII information, whether it's your P PCI, whether it's your IP that you're masking, and then now in today's time, your PHI data is critical as well. So those are some key things that should actually be masked. And then the masking types. What type of masking are you going to do? Do you need to do some full masking? Or do you need to do some partial masking, right? Or is it going to be your regular expression type of masking where you just need to mask an address or something to that nature? So understanding these types of values and what the true need is is going to be important in your environment. 
And then if you're using transparent data encryption or seeking out transparent data encryption, looking for a 256-bit encryption is going to be key. And definitely trying to use data at rest encryption is going to be key if your data walks away from you at some point. I know a lot of times we think our data won't walk away, but nowadays most people are working remote anyway. So if they're working remote, some form of your data is sitting on the laptop, right? Some of your data is sitting on the beach somewhere, basically, because somebody's working remote. Now, the transparent data encryption, there are some key things from the encryption standpoint that, are, that really need to be included. Your wall files, your backup files, your temporary files as well. There's a lot of key data stored in temporary files. A lot of times, temporary files are overlooked. Right, temporary files is for your, basically your workspace, your workspace for your data. So there's a lot of key things there. So you need to make sure that those things are also a part of your encryption as well and keep those in scope. PG Crypto is pretty easy to implement. Building out the PG Crypto extension, it's going to give you the flexibility to utilize a particular column that you may want to encrypt. So if you want to encrypt the social security or national identifier column, using that to specifically use PG Crypto to encrypt that data is going to be handy as well. And then with that, you have several modes, whether it's the MD5, SHA, or within two-way encryption, AES or DES algorithms that can be used as well. And then your full disk encryption options using the Lux um, system. Lux is a great um, feature for encrypting your data. So this is gonna allow you the ability to decrypt a master key, which is also gonna be important when you're talking about bulk level encryption. So the decipher key is used here for Lux, um, as you can see. But Lux is important, it's a rail supported option. So it's probably already available to you on a rail system that you may be using. So it's something that you can definitely take advantage of. And then file system level encryption. So encrypting the entire file system is the other mode. So this is gonna give you the ability to encrypt individual files, individual directories, where you have key directories with important information. So encrypting what you wanna use and what you need to be encrypted on a full disk level is also important. And then there's compliance and controls. So from a compliance standpoint, looking at the controls that you need to have in place, I found this quote, we need new partnerships for peace and security. So partnerships, before we talked about basically partnerships and being making peace with our internal departments such as the security, the database team, right, the applications team, but also there are some other groups as well. The executive management, your internal audit groups, things that people that need to be, help you enforce your compliance and your regulations, right? So in order to do that, one of the things you have to focus on is your configuration management. So everything that you do should be properly documented and maintained so that you're securing things the same way every time. Every time you build, you're building the same way every time. Everyone in your, your team that's doing a build should build the same way as you did your build because everything is based off the configuration management. Right? One of the things you don't want to happen is you end up with what's called snowflake servers. So if you have your process and then you build out your environment using the proper configuration management, and then now somebody applies changes on top of your configuration, then on top of that build, and then you end up with a snowflake server because now those things are not properly tracked within your configuration management. So you don't want to end up with snowflake servers. So what you want to do is do some proper configuration management, make sure you have some examples within your config that shows everything that you need, whether it's a special mount point or directory that your application needs, whether it's special port numbers and users, everything that needs to be built out from a configuration standpoint should be built into your configuration management. Now, if you're using Jenkins, Jenkins has a nice console. 
gives you a nice web UI that you can use, but you can also use the text formats as well to build that out. So from a compliance monitoring standpoint, you really should institute checks. Everyone needs a good checklist. So instituting checks within your process. So your checks for everything that's actually done from a security standpoint, config standpoint as well, but definitely from a security standpoint. So your checklist should follow along throughout your software development lifecycle. So within your checklist, you wanna have things that are directly related to what's happening with your build and actually within your release. Item numbers, item description, status. The last time that check was actually ran, right? Who ran it, what time? Those things are gonna be critical as well when you think about the compliance level. Because if you run a check and that check was actually done by the security team, but you're having a problem with your application, now you know you can go back to the security team and say, hey, what happened with that check? Because you said the results were this, this was the status, but now this is affecting my application. So you wanna be able to track all of those things so you understand what was checked, when it was checked, and by who it was actually checked by. Now within your templates, there are several types of templates or tests within your environment that you actually perform. There's your white box, right? Your white box or your static application testing. And then there's also your black box or your dynamic application testing. So the key thing here, we'll talk about the dynamic application testing, because that's the one that we don't really hear about. So running through those types of tests, that's not the test to test your application code. That's the type of test to test your application as if you were an outsider or as if you were a hacker. Testing your application like a hacker would test your application, basically, that's gonna help you flush out issues because now you're testing it like it would really be hammered on, right? Not your traditional functional testing that somebody might do. When someone knows your system, they're gonna do traditional functional testing. They know exactly what screen fields to hit. So that testing, you're not really gonna flush out a lot of issues, but you wanna do the dynamic application testing. And then there's your SSL and TLS. Encrypting your data that's in transit is gonna be important as well. So Postgres works really well from an SSL um, standpoint. So that's something that most people are using, but if you're not, it's something you definitely should be using as well. Right? And if you're TLS, it's usually typically the most common version is like TLS 1.2 that's supported that people are using today. There is centralized access control as well. So centralized user access control, basically knowing who's accessing your system, how they're accessing your system, and at what levels they're accessing your system, and if they should still be accessing your system. Understanding that, understanding the advantages of password management, understanding the time savings that it takes if your access is actually correct, right? The convenience and the time savings that you'll have utilizing things that are available to you. Single sign-on and LDAP. Single sign-on is one of those things highly used in most environments, but it also creates a major hole as well, right? In most of our environments, we use a single sign-on that's gonna help us connect to multiple applications with that one sign-on. Well, if someone gets your one login, your one sign-on, now they have access to maybe five or six of your company's systems. So it really is used by everyone, but it's gonna be critical on the password management for single sign-on type of applications. Automation and management. So here's a nice quote from Bill Gates. Automation applied to any inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. Okay. So if there are any flaws within your system, if you utilize the automation, that's gonna help you flush out what those flaws are. 
one of the key things is key management, right? So how you manage those keys has to be an efficient process, right? Key management is something that you can't afford to be inefficient, right? So you can't decide that we're gonna do key management and half do it. It has to be fully implemented, right? This is the main thing that's gonna end up to protect you from security breaches. No one wants to end up being affected by one of the government's security breaches that came out that day. Now the government keeps track of security vulnerabilities. There's a database full of them, but nobody ever checks that, right? I'm willing to guarantee that 90% of the people here at the conference today may not know that the government has a database of security vulnerabilities or are they checking it on a regular basis to see if those vulnerabilities are affecting their application. So key management, because you don't want those breaches to actually affect you, is gonna be critical, right? So understanding the key store, key store lists, again, such as HashiCorp Vault, Nitro Key, or UBS HSM, those are some critical ones that can be utilized as well. So being able to manage a key store locally and externally, right? Keeping that key store in a separate location is going to be critical to help you with your key management. And your key management has to follow along throughout your life cycle as well. Now some best practices from a security standpoint. Never use any default values. Default values for ports, default values for usernames, those are things you definitely don't wanna use. Revoking any access that's not needed, things you definitely do not want to have out there as well. Understanding your pghba.conf. Not leaving it wide open to the world. Restricting access to understand who can actually connect to your database is gonna be critical. Some other things would be understanding the privileges. We know that certain application users, certain DBAs have access to a system but truly understanding what application access they have, what database access they have. Do they still need that authority? Maybe they've moved and changed groups. Do they still need to have all of those privileges, right? Never giving up something like a super user privilege, right? Understanding encryption, whether it's one way or two way. What method do you need? What method are you actually using? And then your sensitive data, are you gonna mask that sensitive data? Putting together the proper security baselines and standards to control your entire security best practices and what you have in place. Now implementing DevOps or DevSecOps, right? All of these things that we talked about should be implemented through a program of some sort. You don't necessarily have to use Jenkins, but they should be implemented through a program, right? You don't wanna go around implementing these things manually. It needs to be done programmatically. If it's not done programmatically, then how are you gonna maintain it? It makes it more difficult. So you wanna make sure that you're doing it through a program, some type of scripts that you can automate that will help you with things like applying changes, any type of changes or updates that you wanna apply. And then if you have to add new security checks as well, that's gonna be critical. So are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, so from, yes, so how does HashiCorp, Vault, UBHSM, how do those type of products compare to the AWS secret management, right? So I can only talk from what I've used. Um, I know about the AWS product, but I've only used the HashiCorp Vault product. So um, from an implementation standpoint, it's easy to use, I know that. Um, so I don't know the level of difficulty that the AWS product has to it. I mean, I wouldn't imagine that it would be that difficult, but I haven't used it myself personally. How it, in, in, from a broad line, how do you, how mm -hmm. do you integrate the, 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 
Yeah, so it basically it's more of a plugin that you can actually use to implement it with. No, I do not at this time. So, yeah. yeah. Is there any other questions? Yeah, so depending on the database that you're using. Oh, sorry. So are there any type of particular tools for auditing and logging? Right. So other than using something that Postgres itself offers, um, there are particular database versions that offer some logging features for you. Right. So using PG Audit is one of the key things that would be available from an auditing standpoint within Postgres. Yeah, so that would depend on which key management tool that they're actually using, right, to bring your own key. Bringing your own key today is pretty popular as well. So, um, and I do believe within HashiCorp, you can utilize the bring your own key function. Yeah. Yes. A question about uh, data masking. Yes. Again, do you have any recommendations for that? Or for masking? So I don't really have a recommendation, and I'm not sure of the company. There's a Postgres-based company that has a masking tool that I'm not sure if it's open source. I think they actually sell it, though. Um, I'll try to remember the name for you, and I can get that for you afterwards. But I don't necessarily have a separate recommendation for the masking. Yes. Well, with any, with any type of disk encryption, you're going to take a performance hit. Um, I mean, I would say you're going to have like a five, maybe five to seven percent performance hit, but it's, it's performance over the security value is what you have to weigh out um, when they have that type of situation. Mm. Right. Yeah. All right. It's true. Yeah. So, other questions? So, so one thing, this was pretty nice. Security is not a product, but a process. So there are products that you can buy, open source products you can download, but you have to understand that it's going to be a process. So it's not just something you can buy, and it's going to fix all of your security issues. So that's key. And the last thing. Go ahead. There is no easy button. All right, definitely. So the last thing here is the way to be safe is to never be secure. So you can never go to sleep on security. There's always going to be some type of security fix that you need to apply. Thank you.